Hello, everybody, and welcome to Iceberg to Go, your daily dose of Pittsburgh Penguins news and analysis. You can find us on YouTube at Inside the Penguins or anywhere you get your podcasts from. It's going to be a busy 48 hours, so let's get right to it here. The latest update on the potential Jake Gensel trade that is quickly turning into the eventual Jake Gensel trade. Today figures to be a pivotal day, not just for Gensel, but for the Penguins. What do they get back in return? Who do they end up shipping him off to? What is that return something that is going to help them next season with some young players NHL ready? Or will they get prospects that are going to take a little bit longer to build up and to get ready for the National Hockey League? All of these questions could be answered here in the next 24 to 48 hours, but we got a lot of updates yesterday and a lot of news and a lot of chaos that started to kick off before the Penguins took on the Columbus Blue Jackets at PPG Paints Arena. The Penguins apparently want to get a Jake Gensel trade done by tonight. Wednesday, March 6th, they want Gensel to have that trade done by tonight, according to Darren Dreger of TSN. The reported asking price, according to Dreger, is a first-round pick, a young NHLer, and a top prospect. Nothing new on that terms, but I think the one thing that we're starting to learn, especially with the reports from Elliot Friedman of Sportsnet, saying that Kyle Dubas prefers to get top-line prospects over draft compensation, is that first-round pick could turn into a, a high-end prospect where it is a prospect, a second prospect than a young NHLer. It could be a very fluid situation, especially with certain teams, i.e. the Vancouver Canucks, who already traded away their first-round pick this year to get Elias Lindholm. Speaking of that, that was part of the flurry of activity yesterday, at least on the report scene surrounding this entire Jake Gensel thing. The Canucks are reportedly willing to flip Elias Lindholm to get Jake Gensel. That brings Boston into the fold, who had been non-existent when it comes to any Jake Gensel trade, any Jake Gensel conversation, according to Chris Johnson of The Athletic, that if the Canucks want to flip Lindholm, Boston is the team that could come into play for Lindholm. So whether that is in a three-team trade that involves Gensel to the Canucks, Lindholm to the Bruins, and the Penguins getting a lot of young assets, from the Canucks and potentially maybe one from the Bruins. Who knows what that would look like, but that is an option that is starting to heat up as Jim Rutherford eyes his former young stud in Jake Gensel. The Canucks obviously want to go for it this year, and Jake Gensel would be a huge lift to their offensive firepower that's already in the fold. Following that, we had a little bit of news south of Vancouver, far south of Vancouver in Nevada as the Vegas Golden Knights trade for Washington Capitals forward Anthony Mantha. Again, all of this within a two-hour span yesterday. Things were coming in fast and furious. Mantha's salary is 50% retained from the Washington Capitals, leaving $4.42 million left in cap space for the Vegas Golden Knights, making them an unlikely trade partner for Jake Gensel, but still not ruled out because Gensel's $6 million could partially be retained for the remainder of the season by the Penguins or by a third team if indeed it ends up needing to be a third team with some retained salary. But Vegas seems like they're on the outside looking in of this conversation. Meanwhile, Vancouver, who was thought to be out because of their trade for Elias Lindholm, or at least on the outside looking in, seem to be heating up in this conversation. Other teams that have been in and around this conversation as time has gone on and seem to still be in on Jake Gensel potentially, the Florida Panthers, the Edmonton Oilers, and the Carolina Hurricanes. I would also personally not rule out Los Angeles. They have Victor Arvidsson who came back for the first time after missing the first 50 games of the season. Then he's injured again and put on long-term injury reserve. I'm not exactly sure what his status is, but with him on the shelf, and the potential of the Penguins retaining some salary, there is a potential opportunity for the Kings to be in on this Gensel th deal. Again, a another outside source, another outside team that might be a last minute, get their hands dirty and get in on this conversation. But I do think as of right now, from all the reports, Dreger, Johnston, it seems as, what, as if the Vancouver Canucks should be the favorite to land Jake Gensel today. Either way, seems like we're going to get some answers. We're going to see what that potential return is like. And when that happens, I'll be right back in this seat talking about my initial reactions on any Jake Gensel trade. He was in the building last night. It was a weird night for the Penguins against the Columbus Blue Jackets off the ice, on the ice. Just a weird atmosphere at PPG Paints Arena last night for the Penguins 5-3 to victory 
over the Blue Jackets. And part of that is that they were showcasing an interesting lineup last night. Lars Eller on the first line. Drew O'Connor centering the third line. Yuna Kapanen brought up to be the fourth line setter. Now, Yuna Kapanen is up because of injuries. Nolachari missed the game with an upper body injury. Jansen Harkins also missed this game. So they brought up Kapanen to play that fourth set, fourth line center role, plug and play him, put him there and get him some minutes at the NHL level. I wouldn't take too much into that. The Eller decision on the first line wing next to Crosby and Ricard Raquel, that one gets a little bit interesting. I think that is more so showcasing Eller for a potential trade this week. I think he is one of the top names that could go for the Penguins this week. But also, you know, if there is no market for him, if nobody ends up acquiring Eller, you're opening up some possibilities for next season if you have to move some things around. Now, Eller is a solid center, has been a good third line center for the Penguins all season, but getting him some playing time with Crosby, never a bad thing. Again, I fully expect that he is probably going to be traded here in the next two days, but if he's not, the Penguins then hold on to what has been a pretty good piece for them this season. I'm going to go off on this O'Connor thing for a second. Third line center in this game. A lot of people might not know Drew O'Connor is a natural center. That is his natural position. He's been playing wing pretty much since he joined the Penguins four years ago, but naturally he is a center. So getting him an opportunity to play that yesterday, I thought was an intriguing decision. He's proved this season that he's an everyday NHLer. That was the goal for, for Drew O'Connor coming in this year. Can he prove that he can play and in, door the rigors of a full 82 game season. Can he stay consistent at least at an NHL caliber level? I feel like he's done that and more. He's one of a few players that have played in all 60 games. Now that is probably going to end due to being concussed in the second period, missing the third period and likely set to miss his first game of the season on Thursday against the Washington Capitals. But he's played in every game up to this point in the season. And for the most part, while his scoring has been a little volatile, his performance has been fairly consistent, not to mention the fact that he has been played up and down the lineup, left side, right side, and now we see him at his natural position at center. I think this is interesting because he might be a key piece and a key part of Kyle Dubas's plan going into next season. We know Dubas wants to get younger. Drew O'Connor is one of the few players that have been able to bring that youth to the Penguins lineup that is currently the oldest in the National Hockey League. Give them a little bit of a jump start. Give them a little bit of speed. He also brings some physicality, some size. And as we've seen this season, some finishing capabilities as well as he has career highs in both goals and points on the season. So I think it's interesting that he's had the opportunity to play a third line center yesterday. I think that's something that once he comes back healthy, you might see more and more of in the last 22 games, but he's getting a chance to prove whether or not he can carry a line throughout the NHL level against different competition. That's what I think you'll see going forward. And that's what I think you'll see with a couple of young players in the Penguins organization. The Penguins want to skew younger. They have a couple names in-house that could potentially vie for roster spots next season, but it's going to be these last 22, 23 games where they get an opportunity to really get a jump start on anybody that's brought in at the trade deadline, anybody that's brought in this summer, because Kyle Dubas might want to go out and bring in some young players this summer, but he's going to get an advanced look at some of these guys over the last 22 games. Expect some youth to be ingested into this lineup as the time goes on, not just Drew O'Connor. Let's talk about Valtteri Pustin as well. Pustin, I wouldn't say it's a breakout season. Certainly it is his first season where he's been able to have some staying power at the National Hockey League. I think he's likely to remain in the top six for the remainder of the year now. His nat or excuse me, he's been making smart, solid plays on a much more consistent basis as time has gone on, especially in the last week or so, you've noticed that he's kind of starting to get it. He's starting to pick things up. He's starting to play at a little bit more of an even keel level where the drop-offs aren't as drastic and his ice time is staying up a little bit higher. He's getting more opportunities to play on the power play. Something just feels natural about him on the power play. It feels like a good fit. He feels confident on that unit. He might not be scoring goals just yet, but it seems like when the puck comes to him, the play is made correctly. And that is a huge thing for a Penguins power play that has been disjointed for 90% of the season. So he's going to get opportunities on the power play. He's going to get opportunities to play with Evgeny Malkin, build up some chemistry, build up some rapport with 71. Might get a couple opportunities with Sidney Crosby as the season wears on. But I think the question ends up being, 
can he do enough to make Dubas comfortable relying on him in the top six? Because Kyle Dubas, regardless of what happens over the next couple of days, I think we all expect that he's going to have to go out and find some top six wingers. He's going to have Brian Rust. He's likely to have Ricard Raquel, but Riley Smith and Jake Gensel might both be out the door. So who do you bring in to be top six wingers? If Valtteri Pusinen can take the bull by the horns the next 22 games and he's going to get an opportunity to do just that, maybe he ends up being the penciled in plan for a top six winger. And that way Dubas has to only go out and bring in one big top six winger and start to be able to fill out maybe the bottom six, start to fill out the defense, restructure that a little bit. Uh, Terry Pustin is going to get his opportunities. I think that's the point that we're looking at here and we'll see where he's able to go. This is his tryout basically to be the at least leader in the clubhouse for a top six winger spot heading into next season. That's what he's going to get the opportunity to do over the next 22 games. Another player that I want to talk about, a younger player that might have an opportunity to really improve his stock in the Penguins organization, Jonathan Gruden. He seems as of right now, and he's playing as of right now, like he could be a pretty solid fourth line option for the Penguins next season. Now, is he the best fourth liner in the National Hockey League? By far, no. But is he showing that as a young player, he can handle some in-game responsibilities, that he can play at the pace that is required to play at the National Hockey League night in and night out. As of right now, yes, he's had a nice little stretch here. This call-up right now has probably been his best so far, scoring his first goal on Saturday in Calgary and playing a physical brand of hockey, being evident on the ice as a fourth liner and not in negative ways. That's always what you want to see, especially from a young player in Jonathan Gruden, a young player in the bottom six. Maybe he eventually turns into a Teddy Bluger. I think that might be the ceiling for him. Maybe he'll probably never be as good defensively and his defensive impacts won't be as impressive as Bluger's was over his early stages of his career with the Penguins. But that's the hope for the Pens. If they want to get younger, that includes the bottom six because you look at how Kyle Dubas had to fill out the bottom six last year because they didn't have faith in a lot of these young players coming up. They had to go out and give a multi-year deal to Matt Nieto. Have to is also a strong word in this week. In this, but they went out and they gave a multi year deal to Matt Nieto. They went out and they gave a multi year deal to Nola Chari. They have obviously Jeff Carter, but he should expect it to be gone next season, potentially retiring at the end of this year. At the very least, his contract is up. So you're looking for some young players to fill out the bottom six. Jonathan Gruden has at least earned himself a little bit of leeway here as time progresses in the next couple of weeks, especially if a couple forward names are out the door at the trade deadline. You could see Gruden getting a real big opportunity, which leads me to the last name I want to bring up. Somebody that hasn't gotten a chance this season, somebody that a lot of people are clamoring for to get a chance this season. He's up in my graphic right up here, and that's Sam Poulin. You know, will get his time in the next 22 games. I, I expect it. I hope that it happens. If it doesn't, then it's very questionable. He has had some pretty bad injury luck, especially with the timing of it this season. Missed the beginning of the season with a high ankle sprain. Comes back, lights the world on fire. Doesn't really have a spot in the lineup because Lars Eller's performing well. Nola Chari, that's not really a spot you want to put Poulain in. If you're going to call him up, you don't call him up to put him on fourth line center. They didn't want to remove Eller from that line simply because he had been consistent in that spot all season long. And you're not going to put him out at second line center over Evgeny Malkin. You're just not going to do something like that. That's something that even if it makes sense this season, at a certain point, based on Malkin's performance and Poulain's performance, it's just not something you pull the trigger on, especially because you expected Evgeny Malkin to get out of that rut that he was in. And unfortunately, it took a long time, and now it seems like he's getting out of it for a little bit, but he hasn't had the performance you expect of this season. Poulain, however, when there was an opportunity, Nolachari went down a couple of weeks ago. You thought, maybe you pull him up, he's playing really good hockey, but unfortunately, he was out of the lineup again with an injury. Came back last week, scored three assists in his debut or re-debut of the season. And I think he will get his time, you know, especially with Eller, as I talked about earlier in this episode, potentially out the door. DOC being injured right now because he was the third line center option last night. If he's injured and Eller's out the door, you could see Sam Poulin getting called up as early as this weekend to see what he can do at the NHL level. You have to find out what you have in the kid, but it, because again, Similar to uh, Valtteri Pustinen, if he can come up and he can show you something in the last 22 games, that could change the entire mindset of what Kyle Dubas is looking for in the offseason, especially if he has a hole at third line center. 
because if he has a hole at third line center for trading Lars Eller, which could happen the next day or two, and you have both Poulin and Drew O'Connor performing well over the last 20 games, maybe you don't go out there and spend a lot of money on a third line center. Maybe you give these guys an opportunity to start next season to battle it out to see who gets that role. Not to mention the fact that both of these guys can play the wing. Sam Poulin came into the NHL as a winger, transitioned to center. Drew O'Connor came in as a center, transitioned to winger. These guys have that positional flexibility that Mike Sullivan loves. They have that positional flexibility that Kyle Dubas loves. And as Drew O'Connor has showed, he can play up and down the lineup. And Poulin has that high-end skill, that high-end talent that you're hoping eventually translates at the NHL level to where he can be a top six. I think both of these guys could be a factor on the third line next year, meaning Poulin and O'Connor. But that has to come at the heels of a really good month of March for both of them at the NHL level. O'Connor is injured. He has a concussion. We don't know how long he's going to be out, but he's proven that he is an NHL caliber player. He should be written in pen to make the NHL roster out of training camp next year. Poulin's more of a question mark, and I think that's a question that we're going to get a couple more answers to in the next month. So Penguins going with youth over the last stretch of games. That is the smart thing to do. That is the right thing to do. And we'll see just how many spots they have open in the next couple of days as the trade deadline approaches and passes to see who's all headed out and whose positions need to be filled for the remaining 20 games of the season. But that's going to do it for this episode of the Iceberg to Go. Find us on YouTube at Inside the Penguins or anywhere you get your podcast from by simply searching Tip of the Iceberg. Thank you guys for tuning in. Make sure you keep an eye on all of our feeds because as trades happen, we will have recaps. We will have immediate instant analysis on all of our feeds as soon as we possibly can. But that is it for this episode of the Iceberg to Go. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. We'll see you next time.